morning. I'm Bob Bullock, Deputy Director for Operations for the Nelson A. Rockefeller Institute of Government here in Albany. On behalf of the Institute, our Director Tom Hayes, our Board of Overseers, and our partners in this event, the Center for Technology and Government at the University of Albany, and the Center for Urban Studies at the University of Buffalo. It is indeed a pleasure to welcome you to the Performing Arts Center at the University of Albany. This program entitled The Impact of Light on Communities, Definitions, Effects, and Programs was created in recognition of the fact that communities across the state and nation, many of which were meccas during an earlier time of American industrial dominance, are today in many cases in various states of decline and frequently struggling to provide for essential human needs. Responding to the symptoms of blight and the root cause of these symptoms, Today, countless cities and towns across the nation are having to reinvent themselves with the hope of someday reclaiming their past allure. Identifying the causes of blight and discussing how communities are choosing to combat it is the subject of this program and a subsequent one to be announced at a later date, which will be hosted at the University at Buffalo. This program is approximately six months in the making and owes its existence to a small but dedicated staff of organizers whom I would like to recognize today. They include Teresa Pardo, Megan Cook, and Megan Sutherland from the Center for Technology and Government, myself and Patricia Strack, uh, Strack from the Rockefeller Institute, and Henry Taylor from the Center for Urban Studies at UB. As programs like this cannot occur without a great deal of support, I would also like to recognize the technology company Cisco, which is web streaming this program to and from Detroit, Buffalo, and Albany this morning. We welcome those in Buffalo who are assembled for this webcast and who will be holding a separate regional conversation at the conclusion of the Albany portion of this morning's event. I would also like to recognize Jim Diaz of the University at Albany's Division of Research and TWA Construction Management for their financial support. In Buffalo, I would like to thank Robert Shibley, Dean of the UB School of Architecture and Planning, who is hosting this city's event. Finally, in Albany, I would like to thank the Capital District Planners Association and the Buffalo Chapter of the American Planning Association for granting credit to their members participating in today's proceedings. Could I ask for a round of applause for our organizers? Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today our keynote speaker. He's an individual who actually would be comfortable on this stage for two reasons. In addition to being a distinguished scholar in the area of urban planning, he also is a concert pianist. And if not for the absence of a, uh, of a grand piano on stage, he would be probably very comfortable here today. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce your keynote speaker, whose bio appears in your program today, Alan Malik. Well, I am a little disappointed that there's no piano here, but I suspect you've come here to talk about urban life and not listen to piano music. So I will focus on that. And I think I'd like to start out with kind of a basic definition. Which, yeah. What is blight? And it's funny, when you look it up in the dictionary, the first definition that comes up is the one above. A plant disease caused by fungi such as mildews, rusts, and smuts. And then obviously there are other definitions which probably reflect more of what we're talking about today. But I think the reason that's I raise this is that we have a tendency to think of light as a thing in itself. And what I want to focus on today is that light is not a thing. Light is a condition which has many different manifestations to it, but in particular, it is not something that just happens. It is a physical and visible expression of social and economic problems or issues in a community. It is not distinct from those issues. Now, it is visible, it is highly visible. It's, just, say, it's like many other things in the world, you kind of know it when you see it. 
This, this is a lighted street. It's in an upstate New York City, but I won't name it. It could be any city. And what you see here are a number of specific physical manifestations of light. You see vacant lots. Vacant lots were created where a vacant building has been torn down. You see vacant, you see buildings that are substandard, that are deteriorating, that are clearly not in good shape, but are still occupied. And you also see vacant buildings. And then you also see what some people call visual disorder, which again, are the manifestations of life, the trash, the graffiti, the deterioration of the public realm, cracked streets, cracked sidewalks, dirt where grass ought to be, things of that sort. Now this is the visible manifestation of light, but this is just what's on the surface. What's beneath it is what's important. It's fundamentally about economics. Now this I find, this is a nice image. These are two blocks in the city of Baltimore. They are basically physically identical. The houses are the same size, the same shape, the same construction, the same era. They are less than one mile apart. The houses on the left are occupied, sell for perhaps three or four hundred thousand when they come on the market. The houses on the right are empty and if they sell at all, they would sell for perhaps twenty or thirty thousand dollars. And this is so it's not about the buildings, it's about economics fundamentally. Economics affected by social, political, legal, procedural, governmental, and other factors. So what are the economic factors? Low demand, concentrated poverty, low expectations, low attachment. Blight is a product of a series of social and economic factors, which, what low demand mean? what does that mean? It means that property values are low and likely to still be declining. It means in an environment where property values are low and declining, owners have little economic motivation to improve their properties because they won't see any result in terms of increased value. Upwardly mobile residents, and one of the things that is tremendously important is that every neighborhood in every city is creating people who are upwardly mobile, who are improving their education, their jobs, their incomes, their prospects in life. But if they move out rather than upgrade in place, that reflects, again, the low demand. When houses sell, the people who buy them tend to be investors rather than homeowners. When investors buy these properties, if the values are low enough, what you get are what some people call milkers, investors who are not interested in a long-term maintenance of the properties, but who are basically interested in making a few bucks in two, three, four years, and then walking away. And then finally, if you have persistent low demand, properties don't sell at all and end up being abandoned. So this is, an ex here is a census tract in Rochester where the median sales price in 2014 for houses was 17,500. Now if you think about that for a minute, and you figure that perhaps that house might rent for $700 a month, or $750 a month. And you start to do the arithmetic, and you realize, okay, that's about eight or $9,000 a year. And you say, you buy a house for $17,500, you can make eight or 9000 a year on it. That means, after three years, you've made a 50% profit even if you just walk away from that house. At that point, you find people coming in, buying those houses, who basically rent to anybody with no questions asked, don't maintain the property, 
don't pay their taxes because they know that the city and the county won't catch up with them for three or four years. And then they walk, leaving the neighborhood with a house that's abandoned and in all likelihood beyond repair. So that's a dynamic that repeats itself and is central to the, the production of life, if you will. And one thing, vacancy is incredibly important. This is a chart I created. I looked at the relationship between sales price and vacancy in Youngstown, Ohio. You, this is by census tract. Now, the interesting thing about this is not that sales prices go down as vacancies go up. Duh. I mean, that's hardly a surprise. The interesting thing for this, and for those of you who remember your high school calculus, is that this is, the curve is not linear, it's logarithmic. Which means, it's not just that the prices go down, it's that it doesn't take a terribly great increase in the number of vacant properties, essentially to create a crash in house values. At which point, then the values decline much more gradually as vacancy goes up. So again, it's the shock of increased vacancies that essentially creates the crash. Now, the other thing, oh, there we go, is that once the blight cycle develops, and this is you know, important, it's not that, again, blight is not the cause of the problems. Blight is a symptom. But once you get into this vicious cycle, the blight makes all the problems that much worse and that much harder to solve. I mean, it reduces property values and reduces the desire of people to either stay in the neighborhood or move into it. It increases crime, and there's a fair amount of research to show that vacant properties, neglected vacant lots, so we do have an effect on crime. It affects public health conditions for the people who live in the area, and it undermines the confidence people have in their neighborhoods and their willingness to engage with improving their neighborhood. Again, it starts to make people think I'd rather move out than stay here and fight. Amazingly, there are always wonderful people who do stay and fight, but rarely enough of them. So this is an interesting study that was done in Pittsburgh quite recently, which tracked areas where a property was foreclosed and then sat vacant and then became vacant and abandoned rather than being quickly reused with areas that didn't have such properties. And it's amazing to get this incredible spike during when the property goes into vacancy. And then you see, once the properties got reused, the, the spike drops off. Another indicator, and again using vacant properties, is this is some work I did in Trenton. And what you see here, one of the things that's a pretty good indicator of neighborhood lack of confidence, lack of people retaining properties and so forth, is tax delinquency. Another indicator that's not an indicator of neighborhood confidence, but an indicator of how the outside world of investors and Wall Street people and so forth perceive a neighborhood is whether investors buy the tax liens when they're put up for sale by the city or the county. Because that happens to be a very sophisticated industry, the purchase of tax liens. And so what I've shown here, this looks at vacant properties and looks at the percentage of tax delinquency, and it also looks at vacant properties and whether people buy the tax leads. And again, the message is very clear. 
the more vacant properties, the less likely people are in those neighborhoods to be paying their property taxes and more likely to go into tax delinquency. But also, the more vacant properties, the less likely the tax liens are to be bought by investors. Now, I don't happen to think that having investors buy tax liens is necessarily a good thing. In fact, there are some issues. I know it helps the cities balance their budgets, but it raises other problems. But as an indicator of how the larger real estate market perceives a neighborhood, it's a powerful one. So, essentially, what you get into with life, and this is where the critical issues start to arise, is you get into a vicious cycle where all of these different factors, foreclosures, low property values, tax delinquency, abandonment, and so forth, all reinforce each other and all make things worse and worse. And so the critical role of government is how do you break the cycle? And one of the things that's a problem is that a lot of things that happen in government and public policy are actually not designed to break the cycle, but whether deliberately or more likely inadvertently, actually reinforce and exacerbate the vicious cycle. So again, the tax sale process, which leads to ownership interests in thousands and thousands of properties in urban neighborhood being held by outside investors who triage properties, walk away from those that don't have that have low value, and fosters abandonment and neglect and decline. Many cities have ineffective systems to deal with problem landlords, deal with people who are milking their properties, ensure consistent code enforcement, deal with vacant properties, even make sure that vacant properties are properly secured and maintained rather than allowed to sit open as attractive nuisances for neighborhood kids. So cities often fail to even use the powers that they have to address these issues. Mortgage foreclosure fosters blight. I mean, in New York State, I live in New Jersey, which may be the only state in the United States which has a slower process of mortgage foreclosure than New York State. But if you have a, prop, a process where properties go, once the foreclosure filing has taken place, it can be two, three, four years before title actually passes to the, a new entity. Assuming that the bank or whomever even bothers to go through the process of taking title. The, the, the state laws governing tax foreclosure in New Jersey, New York, and many other states actively work to encourage the continuation of the vicious cycle of life rather than combating it. And finally, the question of where is the city in fact, putting its resources, and what are its priorities? And does the city even have the capacity to carry out effective programs in terms of professional and skilled personnel and resources? So, I'll just, since I, I have five more minutes, I'm gonna talk about a few things that cities can think about doing in terms to address flight issues. And it's about thinking strategically. Rather than thinking, than simply reacting to problems or doing little patchwork here, demolishing this house, fixing up that house, and so forth, it's thinking strategically. And making this a priority, thinking about how regulation, how code enforcement, rental regulation, rental licensing, things like that, can be used as strategies to essentially raise the bar in terms of the maintenance of properties and the quality of rental housing in the community. 
figure out, instead of demolishing, let's say, the 10 worst properties or the property that the mayor's nephew is complaining about, have a strategy to demolish. And all of this, by the way, <coughs> requires having good data. If you don't have data about landlords, about property conditions, about vacant properties, about market conditions, and other things, you're basically flying blind when it comes to trying to address what. And then two other things, building the market, rebuilding the market, and thinking green. And what do I mean by that? Building markets is about not necessarily trying to draw upscale millennials, but trying to restore viability to neighborhoods which have lost you know, their market by vitality. And I'll just one example, Slavic Village in Cleveland is where a coalition of a for-profit developer, a CDC, neighborhood organization, and so forth, are systematically rehabbing houses and selling them to low and moderate income home buyers. They have partnerships with local mortgage lenders. They do the rehab at costs that can be carried by the sales price, $60,000 to $80,000, which makes it affordable to lower income home buyers. In the Oliver neighborhood, the city has formed, in Baltimore, the city has formed partnerships with developers to do, to restore blocks of row houses for a mixture of about one-third ownership, about two-thirds rental housing. So figuring out how to restore neighborhood markets, but in ways that make sense for the people who live in those neighborhoods and live in the community is one key step. And it is doable. It may not be doable in all neighborhoods at the same time in every community, but it is a doable strategy. And it involves creating a pipeline of properties, focusing on rehab. And one thing, I'm a strong believer in home ownership. I think not everybody is going to be a homeowner. Not everybody should be a homeowner. But having a strong core of homeowners, homeowners in a neighborhood is an important thing. Another thing that's interesting is that in most cities, including upstate New York and most other parts of the country, home ownership is much more affordable than rental housing. And I just give this example, is just looking at the median sales price currently and the median rent for a two bedroom apartment in the city of Rochester, New York. Somebody, the monthly carrying cost for the median house, if you can get a mortgage at conventional terms with property tax insurance is half of the monthly rent in the city of Rochester. Second point is, I think we have to recognize in a lot of cities which have lost 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of their historic population peak, is that a lot of vacant land may not be reused for development, for new houses, office buildings, stores, or whatever. Either certainly for the next 5, 10, 15 years, or perhaps longer. And we have to start thinking much more systematically in a much more long-term way about green reuses for that land. Reuses that improve the quality of life of the neighborhood, uh, may address issues like food security, but which basically turn vacant land as such into an asset in itself, rather than simply seeing it as a reservoir for future development that in many cases may not happen for ages, if at all. And I think many communities around the country are exploring this, and building, actually in Detroit, Baltimore, and some other cities, they're actually building an infrastructure of organizations, of resources, of skills to help communities green the vacant land in their midst. So 
Closing. And here, there are three points. I would say nobody should demolish a building in an urban neighborhood without having a clear plan for what to do with that lot so you don't end up with a vacant, trashed, vacant lot in its place. Secondly, this has got to be a project that cannot be managed from City Hall. It has to be a partnership. And again, I would suggest it's very difficult for many people to wrap their heads around the idea that an urban vacant lot is more is something very different from a than a reservoir for future real estate redevelopment. But I think that is a critical lesson. There, green uses are more than a short-term stopgap. So to close, given the fact that light is a function of deep-rooted, underlying social, economic, racial, and political problems in our society, local governments and nonprofits and community groups may never be able as long as those conditions don't change, to eliminate light entirely. But I think what our goal should be is to reduce light and above all, to reduce the effect of light on the quality of life of the people who live in our cities and our towns, especially lower income communities and communities of color. And I think that is an achievable goal and one that we should aim and all work very hard for. Thank you. And this, and of course, since 
these houses are deteriorating as they go along, they become abandoned. So <coughs> while, whether it's technically discrimination or whether it's income inequality as such, it is an extremely powerful driver of life. And the fact that we condemn tens of millions of people in the United States to living at economic levels at which they cannot live decently is a fundamental underlying condition that we have to recognize. We, we shouldn't let it paralyze us from dealing what we, doing what we can do, but we have to recognize that that's a reality. <coughs> Sir, in the back. Flipping the topic a little bit, the relationship between light, urban renewal, gentrification that we're seeing in some parts of the United States. How do they fit together? Do they fit together? How much time do you got? <laughs> <laughs> now that, that is an extraordinarily complicated question. One of the things about the United States is it's a big country. And there are so many different packages of sort of market and economic conditions that now light and, e and gentrification or revitalization are they're related and they're not related in a complicated sort of way. I mean obviously areas that are gentrifying and that's you know that's a loaded term which is I'm reluctant to use in many situations. But clearly, those areas are no longer blighted. Were they blighted at some point? In some cases, yes. In many cases, no. I mean, one of the things that's interesting, and there's been some research on it, is that low-income areas, blighted in part, tend to be persistent. Areas that gentrify tend to be areas they're usually somewhere in between. They tend to have very distinctive characteristics in terms of either proximity to major employers like universities or medical centers, major water bodies, distinctive housing stock, and such. So there is a relationship, but I think it's a tangential one. I think one thing that happens, though, is what you see, and I've been looking at, looking very closely in recent months at Baltimore, what you see is that in these cities is you see an increase in polarization. You'll have Baltimore, you can map the difference. And as you saw in one of my slides, they're physically it's very close. You have areas that are skyrocketing in terms of demand, price, investment, and what have you. And within a couple of miles away, you have areas that are visibly getting worse, more abandoned properties, more absentee owners, fewer people willing to stay in the neighborhood. And of course, you have constant flight of the people whom you would like to keep out of those areas. You also have a situation where as jobs in these cities become increasingly concentrated in downtowns, universities, medical centers, that the job, who has the jobs and who lives in the city are increasingly being uncoupled from one another. And even in a city like Baltimore, where, which is actually seeing decent job growth, the actual number of people in the, who live in the city and have jobs is going down. So all of these are creating an incredible sort of juxtaposition, polarization, contrast, whatever, in the cities between revitalization and decline, AKA blood. And the other thing, and this is well known, but I'll say it because it's important in saying it, this has very powerful racial dividing lines associated with it. It is not 100% but to an extraordinary degree, a racially defined phenomenon. Well, I, I think I have time for one or two more. Then you, ma'am. Every word you say.
say it's being transmitted electronically to Buffalo and Detroit. That's right. um, I actually have uh, a couple of comments rather than questions. Um, the first is um, in, re in reference to green infrastructure. Um, I think it's uh, very important for everyone who is involved in um, economic development and system infrastructure in the cities to understand that green infrastructure provides more than just aesthetic value, that it's also critically important for um, stormwater control, flooding prevention, and um, lots of other economic benefits like pollution prevention, for example. My second point is that, um, I this kind of question, I, I have a theory that one of the um, economic drivers of play is actually um, the uh, federal income tax deduction for mortgages. Mm -hmm. And I think that if that tax deduction was restructured to um, end at the median housing price, um, that it would actually stimulate a lot of um, middle income and low income housing development. Okay, I certainly will second what you say about greening. I think, and in fact, a lot of, you know, one thing, it's a big issue in cities around the country is the problem of overflow from the storm storm sanitary sewers. Then they seem like a wonky engineering subject, but it's really incredibly important. And one of the things that people have learned in the last few years is, you know, rather than spend billions of dollars creating extraordinary engineering infrastructure to deal with this problem and keep the cities from polluting the rivers and lakes. You can address this problem by reconfiguring land masses and landforms so that when the rain falls, instead of being directed into the sewer system as we've historically done, it's directed onto land away from the sewer systems and ultimately into the groundwater where it belongs in the first place. So these kinds of things are amazingly important and they are still below the public radar and I think they really have to be lifted up so that people are aware of the value of green space in cities at all kinds of levels. I'm going to think about the relationship between the mortgage tax deduction and the like. I must say that you've given me a great opportunity for a semi-unrelated rant. <laughs> the mortgage income tax deduction is the single most economically counterproductive feature of the Internal Revenue Code. It, number one, it does not encourage home ownership. There's zero evidence that it encourages home ownership. It, however, it, it encourages house prices to go up. It encourages people to buy larger and more expensive houses. It benefits overwhelmingly the people in the top 10 or 20 percent of the home buyers. It is massively regressive because the majority of lower income and moderate income homeowners do not itemize deductions, so they get no benefit, but the cost of housing is pushed up by virtue of the tax deductions overall effect. And so, now obviously, it provides an extraordinary benefit to the development industry, the home building industry, and the real estate industry, all of whom benefit massively from having house prices higher rather than not. But it is a pernicious factor that distorts development and economic opportunities in this country. However, on, on which note, I thank you again.
Good morning, everyone. Um, as Bob indicated earlier, my name is Teresa Pardo. I'm the director of the Center for Technology and Government here at the University at Albany. And we are thrilled uh, to have you all here to join us today um, to hear from and converse with uh, such wonderful leaders as, as Alan Malik and the other members of our panel. Um, as, uh, as you may know, uh, our plan is the following. <clears throat> we will uh, invite each of our panelists to uh, make a five minute uh, presentation to introduce their perspective on this topic um, to you. And we will do that starting, as you may know, with um, our, our colleague George Galster in Detroit, who will join us momentarily on the screen. And then once each of the panelists have completed their remarks, we will, um, I have a few questions that I'd like to ask them. Uh, and then we'll open the floor uh, for your questions. And our goal is uh, to as, uh, get as many questions in as possible. Um, so uh, I'll start, I'll remind you now, as you ask your questions, please um, uh, design them uh, to be direct uh, and clear and brief. And as you introduce, as you present your question, please actually present your, uh, or identify yourself, introduce yourself um, to the audience. <coughs> So, um, to my left, of course, is our keynote speaker, Alan Mollick. Um, and uh, on our uh, video feed, you'll see in one moment, uh, is George Galster, who is a distinguished professor at Wayne State University. Also on our panel, uh, Gary McCarthy, the mayor of the city of Schenectady, here in the capital region. To his left, we yeah. have... To his left is Nori Yates. It's not Henry Taylor, um, but Nori Yates. <laughs> uh, Nori Yates serves as Governor Cuomo's Assistant Secretary for Human Services. And next to Nora, we have um, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, the founding director of the Center for Urban Studies at the University of Buffalo, another of the SUNY campuses. And to his left, we have a new colleague, Susan Van Deventer, who is a research analyst at the Division of Local Government and School Accountability at the Office of the State Comptroller here in Albany, the Office of the OSC. Um, so please first join me in welcoming the panel who will present their remarks. Monetary terms. 
And their expectations of whether an investment in a property is going to pay off is ultimately a function of what the metropolitan-wide housing market supply and demand relationship looks like. And unfortunately for most of the cities that we're talking about in northern New York, in Ohio, in Michigan, in Baltimore, cities that have most of their population peaks a generation or two ago, the metropolitan-wide circumstances are that we have been building more dwellings than there are households to fill up. And we've been doing this systematically for a long time. And we do it because the development industry finds it profitable to do so, and they frankly don't care if that ultimately results in blighted neighborhoods someplace in the metropolitan area. Let me use my hometown of Detroit as an illustration. We have been building in the tri-county region of metropolitan Detroit every year since 1950, 10,000 more dwelling units than there were households to fill up. 10,000 more per year for 60 years. Now, mathematically, you simply cannot absorb 10,000 extra houses a year without rendering approximately as 10,000 redundant. There's simply not enough households to go around. And so those vacancies are going to show up in the least competitive parts of the region's housing market. So they're typically in the older neighborhoods, in the most fiscally strapped jurisdiction, occupied by households who are the poorest and are households of color. So we have, because of the lack of region-wide controls over speculative construction, far in excess of household formation, we have created the seeds that will inevitably blight certain neighborhoods in our metropolitan area. Sure, low-income people in our, in our neighborhoods who cannot afford high-quality housing are part of the story, absolutely. But an unregulated, speculation-driven, profit-oriented, unplanned, metropolitan-wide system of housing, I think is ultimately the cause of our blight in our core communities. That's all I need to say right now, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, George. That was great. Um, Mayor McCarthy. Thank you, Teresa. Thank everyone for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, I've been mayor of the city of Schenectady for over five years. I first came into the office, uh, and I've been involved in uh, government at different levels. Uh, should have known some of these things. Role of mayor is somewhat different. You, uh, you're the focus of the good things and the bad things. And of course, housing and stressed property is a, a big component of what we do in uh, trying to manage the resources of the community. Uh, I remember, it was shocking to me to become mayor of the city, and I would ask about a particular property, and staff, the mayor, so everybody runs around and get the information together. Our filing system, this is just five years ago, was 100% manual. So they would say, oh yeah, we've got the file on that uh, particular house or building. Oh, uh, Frank is out today, it's on the front seat of his car, we'll get it to you tomorrow. <laughs> and get the file. But the empirical data was not there to really formulate public policy. I wanted to know how many houses were had peeling paint, uh, had major structural issues, had other forms of distress or blight. The only way to do it would be to have staff go through the 16,000 and some files that we have for property in the city of Schenectady and put a chalk mark up on the board and uh, keep track of what the number is. And on the other side of that, is the use of terminology uh, within the industry or within, call it an industry, because we spend so much money dealing with blight, is the, the wide variance in terms. So if a house is vacant, if it's abandoned, if it's unoccupied, it can mean the same thing or it can mean a wide variance of things. A house uh, it's unoccupied, the fire department wants to know if there's anybody in the building or not. It's a simple yes or no. 
but that property, it might be unoccupied this time of year. In the Northeast, you have uh, people spending time in Florida, they're just coming back. The house is unoccupied, but the taxes are being paid, somebody's maintaining it. Uh, it's a good resource within the community. There's other criteria where the terminology would reflect uh, maybe somebody has passed away, there's not a clear succession within the estate, or it's been articulated uh, earlier, people just walk away from property. There isn't the economic incentive to uh, invest in the property or maintain it. And you have, again, different terms uh, that are used for describing the property. And I think it's one of the fundamental things is that we don't have uh, that standardization. Uh, I look at New York State where police and fire data is uh, very standardized. You can pick up police reports in uh, Buffalo, New York City, fire reports. You get a quick summary of what's happened. Code enforcement uh, within our communities, I joke with uh, semi-joke with friends in uh, Albany State Legislature, it's the only time where you'll get a local official who will say, I want more regulation put on localities where that we have to have standardized terms in the reporting that we do to the state, and it's superficial at best. It's very hard to make an argument uh, or build a case when you're lobbying in Albany for assistance. As a local mayor, we all use, again, kind of the same terms, but there's a variance. If I say I've got a thousand distressed properties in Schenectady, oh yes, oh that's terrible. Uh, what does that really mean? Are there a thousand properties that are vacant? Are there a thousand that just have uh, peeling paint? Are there major structural issues? And it becomes very hard to formulate what I believe is a statewide policy, and really should be the basis for nation, uh, nationwide policy, to deal with some of these issues. And so, uh, you know, summarize here, just that I think this is a great forum, uh, working center of technology and government, to have these types of discussion, where that we uh, realize that we're not doing these things in a vacuum. There's a lot of similarities across communities that we can learn and work from, and then you modify that for the uniqueness of an individual community of how you best adapt and deal with the uh, problems to uh, again, strengthen neighborhoods and uh, build real value. Thank you.
like I said, at a monthly basis to look at what are some of the barriers of success for the human beings in these blighted neighborhoods. Um, because I think it, several presentations talk about blight as a condition and a symptom, um, and it's the humans there and the people there experiencing that condition, right? And so what are their barriers to success to really, um, you know, that the state can do a better job of removing some of those barriers. So we looked at um, a variety of topic areas that we all know that poverty is a multifaceted problem and it's based in institutional and structural racism, right, in this country anyway. So we looked at how does that impact the residents of our communities and specifically in top areas such as education, health, housing, obviously is a big component we're talking about today. Um, public safety is a big piece and also accessing economic supports and workforce development. So each month, and this is a monthly basis, all hands on deck, Bless our two pilot communities that about 50 people, including all of our, our leaders. Um, did I see a song? I was trying to see. Um, and because I can talk about core forever. Um, and what the outcome and the goal here is, is to really get the state agencies and the state to learn to remove some of those regulatory barriers, funding barriers, and also how can the local community, we did a, a resident engagement cycle with residents within the neighborhoods, to look at how can the residents strategize about removing some of these barriers that they're experiencing. So if we looked at a resident level, we looked at a uh, local government, kind of neighborhood side level, and then also from the state side, how can we do a better job? Um, CORE's been kind of uh, weaving these structures together because again, it's about getting all the partners on deck each, each month for us. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm gonna jet from here to go to a CORE meeting, it's funny. Um, I just actually sent everybody a note saying, I will be there, but I will be late. Um, and so the, the purpose for us today, and what I want to talk more about, hear more about from the blight side, is what is the impact of blight on the people experiencing it, and then what are the opportunities for success for the residents of the neighborhood to be able to combat some of those issues. Great. Thank you very much. The leaders of also here in Cameron conceptualize blight as a broad regional problem that is mostly concerned with growth, taxes, and market-driven development. <clears throat> this perspective can lead to a minimization of the blight problem in communities of color. When abandoned, or while abandoned houses, buildings, and unproved, improved vacant lots are located everywhere in Buffalo, Erie County, they are disproportionately found in the Latin and black communities. Black, black concentration in these two communities of color is related to the city's historical landscape. Buffalo's far west side and east side communities were centers of manufacturing during the city's industrial age. Big and small factories and commercial establishment, along with working class housing, dominated these neighborhoods. The closing of factories and the exodus of whites to the suburbs hit these working class communities with sledgehammer force. The black east side was the hardest hit in the hit. In the industrial age, the black east side was not only the prime locus of industry, but it was also the city's most densely populated community. Between 1940 and 1970, when thousands of black newcomers entered the city, they moved to the east side, which was being vacated by whites. Many of the east side whites, not moving to the suburbs, relocated to the west side of the city, thereby farther depopulating the community. Today, more than half of Buffalo's most distressed and blighted properties are found on the black east side, and its concentration in this area is a major obstacle to the community's revitalization. Our research, for example, shows that the east side has a neighborhood pattern characterized by abandoned houses, churches, schools, factories, commercial buildings, and unimproved vacant lots, which are interspersed with owner-occupied housing and rental units along with businesses and supportive service institutions. When this pattern of land use is added to the area's poorly maintained rental properties, sidewalks, and streets, the blighted visual landscape
conjures up a foreboding, neglected, and abandoned image. In this setting, we find the lowest value owner-occupied house in the houses in the entirety of Buffalo River County. On the east side, owner-occupied housing is not a producer of wealth. It is nothing more than a cultural artifact. One homeowner said to me, Dr. Taylor, the house next door is empty with a tree growing through the roof. It's worth $16,000. My house is in good condition. I've made big investments in it, and it's only worth 18,000. I just don't get it. I'm gonna still put another 20,000 in my house, even though I know I will never recoup it. So I'm making this investment in my family and my children, because I want them to have a good place to live. This homeowner was talking about the dynamics of the housing market in underdeveloped neighborhoods where blight is a major issue. My point is the need to confront Buffalo's blight problem is inextricably connected to the need to revitalize its underdeveloped neighborhoods. Combating the proliferation of blight must be fused with comprehensive planning, community building, and neighborhood revitalization. Yet, in, in Buffalo, the fight against blight has been decoupled from the larger process of neighborhood revitalization. Instead, the city relies on a strategy of aggressive demolition and the greening of neighborhoods with vacant lots. This strategy is doomed to fail. In these underdeveloped neighborhoods, the hidden cost of blight concentration is high because varied socioeconomic problems, poor health, inadequate schooling, joblessness, poverty, are interrelated and interconnected to it. Therefore, the multi-million dollar investments needed to address Buffalo's blight challenge must be fused to the larger strategy of recreating, rebuilding, and revitalizing these communities of color where blight concentration is found. Helping communities in a lot of ways. It's, it is, it takes a very long time in New 
York State. It's hard to say exactly how long is the data really aren't that great, but Congress data, when you look at it, it comes out as one of the top, uh, one of the slowest processes in the country. Um, and some of the changes made to the process since the foreclosure uh, crisis, since the mortgage crisis, have actually lengthened the process, and in some ways that's um, creating problems for local governments because properties stay in limbo a lot longer than was the case before. And also, research indicates that long foreclosure processes don't have better outcomes for borrowers, than borrowers necessarily either. Um, if a mortgage is not cured um, within the first year after becoming seriously delinquent, it's very unlikely that the mortgage will ever be you know, paid up. And so, in a way, some of the steps that have been made to make the foreclosure process more borrower friendly may not be having the intended effect. And we know, as Alan mentioned, that neighborhoods with high foreclosure activity have um, a lot of challenges in terms of higher crime and uh, lower property values and higher costs for things like court enforcement and demolition when um, things get really bad. Um, so, so now we're looking at the zombie property problem, and that's not just a mortgage foreclosure issue, but a, a broader problem of vacant abandoned properties in, uh, that can be concentrated in a lot of our uh, cities especially. And looking at some of the measures that are being taken to address that, and I know that the governor's office announced last May a voluntary agreement on the part of financial institutions to do a better job of maintaining their they can abandon foreclosures throughout the foreclosure process and not just at the end when they take possession of the properties. And there's also, as part of that agreement, um, the Department of Financial Services is going to develop a vacant property registry, and they have. So that should give us a leading indicator kind of for when distressed mortgages are at risk of falling into um, kind of a zombie property leading indicator, if you will. Um, and that information is supposed to be shared with local governments. So that's a promising development. And then we are uh, looking at land banks as a new tool that local governments can use to address blight. And uh, those are new uh, not-for-profit corporations. They're not new in the country. Many states have had them for decades. But in New York, they, they came into existence. Uh, they're authorized by law that was enacted. 2011, and so far 15 land banks have been authorized. Some of them are brand new and haven't you know, not been running yet, but there are a few that have been active for several years now. And um, I've been looking at their financial reports, and one of the challenges they face is funding. Because they're dealing with the market failures, um, they're not kind of profit makers, and so one of the challenges will be funding going forward. Um, some of the things we've been looking at at the Detroit's office. Great. Thank well. you very much.
these efforts in revitalizing the area and put their private money on top of the city money. The term of art is called leveraging. Strategic targeting is all about investing the public funds in such a way that you leverage private money on top of the public money. That's the only way you're going to make a significant impact. The public sector just doesn't have the bucks to do it on its own. So geographically focusing the effort, which is often politically difficult to do, is what I'm recommending. And the specifics of what this geographic targeting needs to do is to go back to the fundamentals that I mentioned in my opening comments about changing the willingness and the ability of property owners to reinvest in their property. It, it has three components, essentially. Number one, as Alan suggested, try to get more home ownership in that neighborhood. So programs that can rehabilitate or construct new housing with subsidies that can help low-income people become stable homeowners in the neighborhood is one first step. Secondly, you have to deal with the existing homeowners who may be willing to invest but unable to do so. And for them, you can think of grants or forgivable or deferrable loans as a way to help them reinvest in their property if their current income can't support it, but they want to do it. And the third component has to do with those landlords who are able to invest but unwilling to do so. Now, they're the hard ones. You can offer carrots to them uh, in terms, again, of the financial incentives or infrastructure improvements by the city that try to build their confidence in the future of the neighborhood. You can do community organizing. But then you can also apply the stick of a selective code enforcement on those recalcitrant homeowners. So I think this three-pronged strategy of building home ownership rates, assisting the homeowners who are willing but unable to invest, and forcing the folks who are willing to invest but unable to do so uh, to collectively invest in these targeted geographic areas where the city is putting their staff time and their money to support the private efforts. Marvelous. Thank you very much, George. Uh, would anyone from the panel like to contribute to this question about how can individual jurisdictions remedy life? Henry and then Alan. Yeah, there's one thing I want to emphasize. Uh, both Alan and, and uh, George have placed a lot of emphasis on home ownership. Uh, I want to go in a slightly different but complementary direction. In a lot of the work that we're doing, what we see in, in communities of color and in low-income communities are a large number of low-income renters in these neighborhoods, especially in African-American communities and Latino communities. In many instances, 40, 50, 60 percent of that population are, are renters. And in most instances, there's about a 50% difference between the median household income of the renters and the median household income of, of, of the homeowners. Based on the field work that we have been doing, I believe that the depressor of housing values and the driver of the uh, of blight in those neighborhoods are the renter properties. And that we have to develop a strategy of a kind of a twofold complementary strategy. One, I think in every neighborhood, we need to develop a minimum standard by which we allow that neighborhood not to fall. Then, on the basis of that, you have to find a way to identify those rental property owners that can maintain their properties. And here I'm talking about not only maintenance, but the kinds of upgrades that include landscaping, the planting of flowers, the paintings of the exterior, those elements that will change the visual landscape of the neighborhoods. In the instances where you have owners of, of those rental properties who can afford but choose not to, we have to apply a stick in relationship to those particular owners. For the owners of rental properties, that cannot afford to make those kinds of upgrades and improvements, then we've got to guide we provide resources there. We also have to find a solution to what I call the, the calculus of low-income rental housing. And that is for the owner of a rental property to generate a profit, they've got to generate rents that exceed the cost of maintenance, upgrades, uh, operations, <laughs> fees, taxes, and mortgage if they own it. In many instances, given the low income of these renters, 
They can't generate profits that high, so they start to cut back, starting with maintenance and upkeep, and forget about upgrades. So that is an issue that we have to be able to, to deal with, given the, 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 the dynamics uh, of the low-income rental uh, housing issue. Great. Thank you very much, Henry.
lot of them would not have come to the city of Schenectady. We gave them a free lunch. They came in, and it was great. Mm -hmm. We had everybody put their business card in a bowl. So now they're, they're also telling their stories, how great they are. These are realtors. They uh, want to sell property. I've got all this property, so I created some angst in the corporation <laughs> council's office. But I took the business cards, pulled them out, and randomly assigned lists so that everybody who came to that luncheon walked away if they wanted with a real estate list. So I had individuals who would never have sold distressed property any time in their life, but they just told me what great realtors are. They can sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> a piece of property here that is a little bit of challenge. You've got to be able to sell it. And we, uh, a typical real estate contract, the 6% commission, we offer a larger commission, 10%, uh, 15%, sometimes 20%, depending on what the value was. But properties that we would give away for a dollar before I stopped that, uh, we now, the first year it lagged a little bit, but City of Schenectady generates a million dollars a year in the sale of distressed property. Uh, we sell houses for $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. We work with the realtors, we look for income and financial verification so that they can go in, buy the property, and be able to rehab it. Our focus is on creating owner-occupied housing. There's some buildings that, just by the very nature of it, will never be uh, owner-occupied. So that while that's our primary focus, we will also look for individuals who come in and are looking to have an investor relationship where they're going to rehab it and convert uh, to rental property. Uh, it's been a, uh, a challenge. We uh, there's title issues and we've got literally hundreds of properties that we've sold in this manner and you think you've seen it all and then something else will come up to be some complicating factor that you have to work through uh, some element that uh, is unique to the property and we've uh, become accustomed to just dealing with that you try and solve one problem at a time, uh, get one more house, uh, one more building, convert it back into private ownership, get somebody who wants to invest in it. And uh, it's building traction. It's not happened as fast as I would like, but it's really growing. And again, the realtors view uh, Schenectady somewhat differently. Uh, we do open houses once a month. On that day, I put the command staff of the police and fire department out, the uh, superintendent of schools uh, participates in it, we have building principals. So when realtors are showing houses where people have questions uh, about crime, about the schools, I'll have the fire chief there, I'll have the police chief there. Uh, the superintendent of schools will be there to answer the questions uh, in <coughs> deal with what are perceived problems and really talk about the good things that are there and the real uh, potential for long-term value. We have a community that's uh, been turning around and so somebody that's coming in, uh, use the term being an urban pioneer, uh, looking at real estate opportunities. If they want to come in, they want to invest in real estate and Schenectady. If I can continue to do the things that I'm doing, working with uh, city council, with uh, the school district, uh, our county legislature, that we're going to be able to have uh, a complete turnaround, not only what we've done in our downtown, but in our neighborhoods, and that people who invest today will be able to see a realistic return on that investment. Thank you very much. So talking about the people of the neighborhoods, so Nora, you're, in your opening remarks, you talked about working with people. Could you share with us what your view is on, um, on how neighborhoods and the residents uh, in these communities that have been characterized here today uh, are affected by play? And what are some of the successful examples of comprehensively addressing um, these issues in the neighborhoods? Great. So um, I think one of the things we keep, we talk about play in the condition of buildings and the impact on larger neighborhoods. And then when we look at the residents of those neighborhoods and, and the incidents of poverty in those neighborhoods, we have to recognize that blight is a multifaceted problem and poverty is a multifaceted problem. So the solutions have to also be multifaceted. And no one uh, solution or no one thread you know, can be uh, 
is that the state recognized that although the um, progression of our economic recovery was growing, and that's great, our, our economy's growing, there's, you know, people are recovering and houses are gaining more value, but the concentration of poverty is actually getting geographically tighter and then getting deeper. So the distance between where the state partnership can intervene is actually growing further because it's harder for the state to then grow uh, and partner with a smaller and smaller geographic entity, right? So, you know, we can intervene with counties or with cities, um, but how can the state look at the resources that we are investing in these very specific neighborhoods and, and partner with the neighborhoods to figure out a way to better use those resources to actually help people? Um, and so there's a lot of transformation going on across these different um, sectors, right? There's healthcare transformation, there's housing development in a lot of different ways, supportive housing, senior housing, affordable housing on various income levels, both affordable at a 60% AMI and then for folks who are below the 60% AMI, which is not is a lot of people, we're looking at low income, you know, even lower income housing development. And then there's reform in the public safety sphere with community policing and recognizing that there's a procedural justice issue um, in working with communities of color. And so the last piece I'll just mention too is the educational transformation. So we worked with our school districts in both of our neighborhoods um, who both had community schools and looking at a community school or a school building as an anchor, a miniature anchor institution, um, much like the hospitals or the larger, the healthcare institutions or the anchors. And so how do we consistently draw the link between um, what's going on in public safety um, and interacting with residents, what's going on with community schools and education, improving educational outcomes, and then with healthcare. So in New York State, there's the district healthcare Medicaid redesign. It's insanely large and complicated with way too many acronyms, um, which that would mean that it would be even further from the communities that it touches. So in the effort to address blight and address the needs of the citizens, how can those resources more effectively meet and remove those barriers that they're intended to do? So for Medicaid recipients, for asthma patients, for example, so in blended communities, there's a higher incidence of asthma, right? Due to either environmental conditions or poor health outcomes for the residents there, it could be because I see your five. Uh, raise your five. Oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. Um, so just for the asthma example, so where do those little kids, um, I can do them, I'll have one. Okay. Um, uh, for the asthma piece, so the state is very invested in making sure that the folks who have asthma don't go to the ER, that they have better prevention, right? So that makes sense. Um, but where do those folks who have asthma go every day? Those little kids go to school every day. So how are the school and the school, the elementary school, which is under-resourced, has overtaxed, has a lot of kids going on, a lot of complex kids, um, be able to really target the, this specific intervention and better support, well, does that mean that for our elementary school um, here in the city of Albany, that there's a outreach worker that typically sits at the hospital that instead needs to sit at the elementary school and talk to the parents as they drop off, hey, you should pick up the inhaler, or talk to the kids about what are, you know, remediations, you know, did you guys pick up your room? Maybe somebody can talk to my kids about picking up their own bed too. Um, but making those connections in a way that they had never made. And, and oftentimes they never sat in the room. I often had to make introductions for folks who lived down the street from each other. Thank you very much. Um, we, we are going to ask a couple more questions to, uh, uh, to Henry and to Susan. So if you are um, thinking of a question, uh, sit tight. We'll get with you in, in just a minute. But if you haven't thought of one yet, start thinking. Henry. Neighborhoods, we talked about neighborhoods. You um, wonderfully in your remarks characterized a, a difficult situation, I think, in Buffalo and, and likely in other cities where blight, uh, as it turns out, is, is very heavily concentrated in black uh, neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color. Could you talk a little bit more about why this is the case? Give us a little bit more understanding. Historically and, and in the present, we from a city building process, a metropolitan city building process, review black neighborhood development and the development of neighborhoods of color as non-essential, unimportant, and incidental to the processes of building the city. So as a consequence, both in the past and in the present, African-American communities have been built on the most undesirable, 
residential sections of the city. And, and that is connected to the way we build cities. And so at any moment, at any point in time, at any location, at any place, you will find those communities anchored in these most undesirable areas. Historically and in the present, they have always been situated on blighted land. There's nothing new about this. In the past, we have used the definitions and concepts of white to attract resources to those regions, but we have rarely used those resources for the redevelopment of those neighborhoods and communities. To flip that, we must see black neighborhood development, the development of Latin neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color as high priorities and as an important part of the way we build metropolitan cities. Today, instead, in location after location after location, we are recreating the central city for the white, college-educated millennial and white <coughs> professional classes and creative classes. And everybody else is left over to the side to defend as best they possibly can. This is the harsh reality that these conditions of underdevelopment in these neighborhoods are direct manifestations of systemic structural racism. That is the truth we must face. Now, if we can face that truth and begin this process of development, it has to be driven by a process that includes comprehensive planning so that we can link physical development, social development and institutional development into a coherent policy of rebuilding neighborhoods. Strengthening institutions are extremely important because institutions, not individuals, are the forces that mitigate uh, undesirable outcomes in neighborhoods and in communities. So we have to see issues that you've talked about, issues of physical development and building of the institutions as operating within a single comprehensive plan. We also have to see that connected to community building. So the process of transforming and changing of neighborhoods is driven from the bottom up, not from the top down, with the end product being the revitalization of that neighborhood and community. If we do not treat neighborhood development in this comprehensive way. It will be like the sound of one hand clapping. <laughs> it will make no noise. Only by bringing things together will we be able to make it. So we have to move away from parcel level decisions to community decisions, from ad hoc development to comprehensive planning, and then I think we can begin to make a difference in the realities of these communities.
property, property problems effectively. Um, and on other, there are other stakeholders, though, too, that have valuable data. Um, like I mentioned, the Department of Financial, so Financial Services is collecting. They collect information from banks on delinquent mortgages, and they also collect now this vacant property registry. And I think that really we should um, all kind of clamor for that data <laughs> so that they put it out there. Um, I think they, from talking to them, it sounds like it might be something that you could get on request for with your own like local government to make a request of it. It's not like it's going to, they're going to be proactive in this offering. And so I think you know that it's out there and uh, try and use it. <laughs> um, also, the courts have a lot of data on judicial foreclosure and from um, talking to people in the court system, it really, how effective the foreclosure process can be can depend on the availability of um, data on the properties, the potential foreclosure properties in a given region. So they've been able to kind of innovate in some ways in certain court parts and certain court calendars by kind of uh, scheduling days that work for the financial institutions. But it's hard to expand some of those pilot <coughs> programs uh, into other geographic regions because the data just doesn't exist in the same way. So um, there are opportunities there. And finally, I just, uh, as a pie in the sky kind of thing, uh, GIS uh, mapping data is really a powerful tool that is underutilized in the state, I think. I, it's expensive, it's a heavy investment of staff resources to learn how to use it and leverage it, and you need a lot of data to really exploit the power of it. But if you make those investments, then um, the ability to tell the story of blood and really target interventions to specific census blocks and neighborhoods where it's most needed um, becomes a lot more doable. So those are some of the opportunities. Great, great. Thank you very much. Across the panel, we've heard about strategic targeting of properties. We've heard about collaboration. We've heard about creative solutions like the one presented by Mayor McCarthy. We've heard about people. We've heard about past and history. Um, so I think that the panel has put us in, I think, a very good position to continue the conversation over the next 20 minutes to address some of the questions that you may have. Um, and so I'm going to ask actually for a little bit more light because I, I, I can't actually see anyone. Um, so if you raise your hand. Uh, so could we have a little bit more light uh, on yours? Great. And who, who, would have, who we have a question over here. Uh, and if you, uh, if you do have a question, uh, just raise your hand um, briefly and, and let be sure that the mic um, runners know where you are so that we can queue you up uh, and get as many questions in as possible. Okay, so we do it. And if I could ask you, um, sir, uh, and anyone else who has a question, just introduce yourself, tell us where you're from, and, and then present your question as briefly as you possibly can. Thank you. My name is John Bachelor. Uh, I was with Empire City Development as a uh, policy and research uh, director. Uh, listening this morning, uh, it sounds like much of what's going on here is a result of metropolitan level economic processes and uh, economic and racial segregation really exists in the metropolitan level. And yet the responsibility for dealing with problems has really been thrust on cities that are very weak fiscally. Uh, if you look at upstate cities, they have half the property tax payments for residents that the suburban areas around them have. Um, they, you know, they have most of the problems of housing and, and crime that uh, exist in the metropolitan areas. So the question is, and they're losing populations. Buffalo lost 10% of the population in the last 15 years. So what are you doing? I mean, how, is there a way to move the responsibility so that the responsibility for these metropolitan problems doesn't rest entirely on the cities? It can be shared by residents and communities around them that actually are part of them. Teresa, can I respond? Do you have a specific person you'd like to respond to that question or to the whole panel? I can see Alan is jumping up. Yeah. So Alan, uh, Alan will take that first, and then I'll invite the rest of the panelists if anybody has to Alan, and then, uh, uh, and then Nora, and then Henry. Oh, no, not Nora. No, George. Oh, George. Oh, sorry, George. You put it up. I mean, that's right. So, <laughs> the voice in the sky. The voice in the sky. So, uh, yeah, Alan. well, I'll just start. I mean, it's clear that 
individual local governments are not in a position to have any influence over that process. The, but at the same time, all of the systems of metropolitan government, of local government, the allocation of resources, the allocation of powers and so forth, are derived entirely from the state. And there is absolutely <coughs> no reason, other than some obviously some fairly powerful political reasons, that the state legislature could not, tomorrow or when they next reconvene, abolish municipal, individual municipal boundaries, or consolidate every region in the state of New York into single regional municipalities. The province of Ontario, just to the north, did much that same thing some years ago with respect to multiple municipalities in the Ottawa and Toronto metropolitan areas. They simply dissolved the municipal boundaries and created metropolitan municipalities of Toronto and Ottawa. Obviously, there are compelling political reasons why that would probably be something of a non-starter at this point. <laughs> However, I think what the legislature and the administration, and again, this keeps coming back to the state level, should start thinking about, are there ways within the political framework to start making the, the urban, suburban, metropolitan, municipal environment more permeable? Can we look at revenue sharing models similar to what they have in Twin Cities, for example? Can we look at some giving somewhat more power to regional planning agencies to try to affect the course of development the way you have, again, in Twin Cities, in Washington State, in Oregon, and other places. So I think this is really a critical issue for the state government, again, the administration and the legislature, to look at recognizing the political issues involved, but to say, how can we start changing this will fossilize dynamic that's in place today. Great, thank you, Alan. Um, we'll go to George and then to Henry and then we'll ask another question. So who's queued up for our next question? Do we, I, 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 oh, there we go. Okay, so we have a question way up there and then here. So we've got two and three. And so George and then Henry, if I could ask you to keep your responses brief so we can be sure we get any other questions uh, asked, answered before we um, before we close for the day. Uh, George, you can't sure. see me, but I'm pointing at you. I agree that the state has massive responsibility for changing the way that responsibilities are currently allocated. Uh, if I were emperor of any state in the Midwest, uh, the first thing that I would do is uh, institute a requirement for metropolitan-wide planning processes, similar to what the state of Oregon did in the 1970s. Uh, among those plans were region-wide revenue sharing, growth boundaries, uh, provisions for uh, all sorts of collaborative services where uh, the underlying sources of blighting influences and interjurisdictional inequalities were dealt with at a higher uh, spatial scale. And, and that's where our problem is in the Midwest. Our governance structures don't match the geography of our problems. And we do have to overcome this archaic historical fact of how our governments were structured in, in American history if we're, we're going to make fundamental progress. Great, thank you very much, George. Henry. Yeah, I, I just concur 100% with everything that Alan and George said, so I don't want to repeat any of that. I'll simply add that, that one, municipal inequality and inequity is a monster problem that, that we face. That the creation of what I call many municipalities create opportunities for people to disappear into these small locations, maximize the development of these communities without paying their fair share to the rest of the region. And that is just dead wrong. And we can do better than that in, in terms of governance. Also, we're facing a new wave of problems, not just the central city. And I think the wake up call was, was Ferguson. Today, we find that in the 100 largest metropolitan regions, over 50% of African Americans no longer live in the central city. They're located out in these micro mini uh, municipalities. And if you think that the cities have problems and difficulties with financial resources, these poor 
many municipalities that are struggling, and a lot of them turn into what I call vampirism, where they utilize excessive ticketing and other types of things as, as revenue generators. So tackling the problem of municipal inequality and inequity, I think, is going to be one of the great challenges that we face. And I would just be part from, from Alan slightly. <laughs> I said, yeah, we, we need to make this political change a major part of, the, of, of our priorities, as well as operating within the existing structure. Thank you very much, Henry. Our next question, um, remember to um, uh, introduce yourself. Andrew, and let us know if you're directing your questions to a specific panelist. Um, it's not quite specific. I'm first around City of Troy. I also work for the Troy Community Land Bank, proud alum of this very institution. Um, <laughs> okay. Susan mentioned New York State Land Banks earlier and that there's been kind of a proliferation of them in the last few years. They're not fully understood by municipalities and I guess the state at large. So my question is about um, the nonprofit that's even understood more poorly than those and as community land trusts. I um, know the Center for Community Progress has done some research into potential alliances between land banks and land trusts. I was just hoping that anybody could shed some light on findings there. So I guess that would be for Alan mostly. Alan, anyone else want to weigh in? Okay, great. Thank you. They're actually quite different, very different animals, even though they sound somewhat similar. I mean, basically, the idea of a community of a land bank. And New York State allows cities and counties and combinations of cities and counties to create them. It is to create a dedicated entity within the city or county or group of cities that can take control of, maintain, and dispose of vacant properties. And basically be an entity that has a lot of flexibility, very serious powers, but above all is a clearly defined mission and responsibility to address the vacant and problem properties. And, and they, these, again, they're very new in New York State. I don't know that there's a whole lot of results to show yet. But they've clearly shown some good achievements in other places like you know, Ohio and Michigan. So they're an important tool. Community Land Trust is typically an organization that's created to hold land in a community essentially on behalf of the community. And one of the classic models is where people build affordable housing, where the land trust owns the land, leases the land to the family that buys the house, and ensures that it stays in perpetuity affordable housing. Clearly, where you have a land trust in the community, there are opportunities for partnership, especially as part of the neighborhood revitalization strategy, because the land bank can create the resource of vacant land that can be then taken on by the land trust and maintained on behalf of the community. And that can involve affordable housing, but perhaps even more importantly, in many of these communities, it can also involve long-term stewardship of vacant land or that's being green either for stormwater retention or for community gardens or mini parks or other things. So I think particularly where you are trying to revitalize a neighborhood which has a large vacant land inventory, I think the opportunity for a collaboration or a partnership between a land bank and a land trust is very strong. One problem, of course, is that there aren't a huge number of strong community land trusts in existence. I know there's one in Syracuse. I don't know about other upstate cities. And the resources to get one off the ground can be daunting. But it's a, where you can create a partnership that can be very productive. Great. Thank you very much. Nora? Um, we've worked a lot with um, the land banks, both our cities, and, um, and specifically in New York, I would say um, the Newburgh neighborhoods that we work in have, there's, there's about 60% vacant buildings in the Newburgh neighborhoods that we're working in. And in the rest of the buildings there, it's about an 80% rental rate. So home ownership was a completely foreign concept. And even if someone wanted to buy something, um, these beautiful buildings, if any of you not been to Newburgh, you should go to Newburgh, it's a gorgeous city. 
so um, I know there's a project brewing for Newburgh uh, Community Land Bank in addition with a local developer in the region, as well as the local supportive housing provider, which did, uh, they have a tremendous provider who built a supportive housing, mixed use supportive housing, also artist loft space and performance art space in Newburgh. It kind of was one of the revitalizing organizations down there. And so this partnership will allow them to identify the need of local residents and serve the need of local residents at the same time by taking, I think, the goal is 19 buildings in this one kind of three block radius, which will be transformative for, for our neighborhood. So assuming that that moves forward, I can't say whether they will, but assuming it moves forward, um, I think the land banks are a vital tool, assuming they're connected to the residents who are there and not kind of the speculative risk. Um, so I know we have more comments on this question. What I would like to do is go back to the floor for the next question. But before you start, um, is there a fourth question? Somebody grab the mic to a fourth question. Actually, I'm going to go back here because you already had a chance. Where's the, the last mic? Up in the back. Oh, yeah. So that everybody has a chance to ask at least one. Well, not everybody. Um, and so what I'd like to do, because we're closing down, I'd like to take both both questions and then open the response uh, to the panel, either to either of those questions or to one that was previously asked. And then we will hand the mic back over to our uh, host bubble. Okay, so if you could do the same, introduce yourself and direct your question and keep yes. it brief, please. I'll try. Thank you. Uh, Darren Scott, I work for the Albany Housing Authority. I'm board chair of the Detroit Housing Authority. I'm also on the board of the Affordable Housing Partnership and also on the board of the Community Action Partnership. So, um, the issues of uh, distressed housing and communities and people living in the my wheelhouse. My question is I'd like to get back to gov government not being able to do it all. I think that's very important. And uh, ask the question how do we generate the massive uh, infusion of equity that's going to be needed in order to help stimulate and turn these neighborhoods around? And what I'm thinking of is a uh, low income housing tax credit program, which is the largest housing generator of affordable housing in the United States. Uh, how do we take that kind of a program, that kind of idea that brings in private capital and expand it to an entire neighborhood or an entire city so that we have um, like a performance contract uh, that you know we meet goals for investors over a period of time and they, they in turn realize uh, the benefits of the tax relief and the cities, the communities get the infusion of capital up front and it's, it's up to them how they decide to use it. Great, thank you very much, great question. Second question and then we'll go to the, to the panel and I'd like them to uh, provide brief remarks. Okay, um, my name is Erin Real. I work for the United Tenants of Albany. I'm also um, the Community Advisory Committee uh, for the Albany County Land Bank. Um, and uh, so just, if I could, give me one quick second to just clarify that Albany does have a uh, land trust, and it's a great one. <laughs> um, and uh, we are, I, I just want to touch on that really quickly because the, uh, the thing that sort of keeps coming up for us locally is the fact that those kinds of partnerships would make sense, and they do make sense, but the funding to make sure that a, a land trust uh, that's already grossly underfunded, right? Needs the money in order to get the um, it, that permanent affordability to take it from the land bank, make it affordable, but also keep it in the hands of somebody that is currently in the community and is of a certain income bracket and just kind of that kind of thing. So the funding piece is a big piece. If there's gaps and we can't make it work right. Um, and that kind of gets to my second thing because, you know, United Tenants. Briefly. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I got this part. This part's written down. Okay, okay. okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I'll, um, I just appeared. So I said, uh, like Alan said, light is fundamentally about economics. And uh, we know that affordable housing makes uh, economic sense for people who are in the moderate to low income brackets. Uh, what would your response be to public officials who make the argument? that the local market is not strong enough to have too many regulations or policies on developers, like set-asides, 
which require certain percentages of affordable housing within large developments, or require these developers to pay fees that would go into a fund to subsidize affordable housing, which is what we need um, We want, so they, well, they, most developers want to create luxury affordable housing. By the way, they want to receive tax credits for those developments. Um, so, yeah, I'll stop there, but that's what I'm Okay, great. So, um, so we have uh, one minute, <laughs> maybe two minutes, before we hand the mic back over to Bob. And so we have two questions. One has to do with infusions of equity, and one has to do with regulation. And what I'm going to ask, maybe I oversimplified, right? But what I'm going to ask our panelists to do is in 20 or 30 seconds or less, respond to either one or both of those as briefly as you possibly can, and use that to transition to an after-program conversation with, between you uh, and one of our question asked, uh, question one of our audience members. Um, so if I can invite you to do what I think is pretty much an unreasonable thing to request. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, so who would like to start uh, with their 30 seconds or less? Henry. My 30 seconds. In terms of political community and public dollars, I think we should fight to say that any public investments uh, in housing has to be ca carried with it some form of inclusive zoning. Uh, it's essential. Um, otherwise, private developers should not ask for any levels of government support, tax credit, or anything else. And there has to be a firm rule about that. Uh, the goal is to not just build a prosperous metropolitan city. The goal is to build a just city. Thank you very much, Henry. That's wonderful. Next, who'd like to go next? Alan. I'll talk about the, the equity infusion. I think one idea that's been kicking around for a while, and I think makes a whole lot of sense, is create a tax credit for investment in restoring vacant properties for home ownership in neighborhoods. It could be done as a state, but it would probably be better if it were done at the federal level, but it could be done as a state initiative and it could be designed so it would motivate individual people to fix up houses, contractors and small developers to build individual houses and sell them to homeowners and help and as part of an overall neighborhood revitalization strategy. I think it's doable. I think the money would ultimately in terms of additional tax revenues and additional incomes would be beneficial and would come back to the state many fold. And I would recommend and be certainly happy to talk to anybody about how such a program could be designed. Great. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, Gary and George, are you uh, ready to get into the queue? Anytime. Okay, so we will uh, go first with Mayor McCarthy and then we'll talk to you. I disagree 100% with what Alan just said. And would, my perspective would be that you need a clear national policy. And I believe we're already spending money. When you look at the money that is really wasted in the local government in terms of uh, police, fire, code enforcement, where you're dealing with these distressed properties and the related negative influence they have on the neighborhood and community, that if you had a give a national tax incentive or policy in place that would allow people to deal with these in a manner where the numbers work because you got to line up the financing. Whether you're doing uh, low-income housing, uh, fair market housing, whatever it is, in some of these urban areas, the numbers just don't work. And they have to have uh, incentives there to allow us to address the needs and the problems that exist. Great. Thank you very much. George, 30 seconds or less. <laughs> One aspect of this whole problem that we haven't talked about is the fact that we need to create in the future more compact cities. We can't keep sprawling like we're doing in the regions that we're familiar with because of the carbon footprint that we're leaving. It's not environmentally sustainable. What's that got to do with life? If we were serious about creating compact cities and stopping sprawl, growth boundaries, freezes on and suburban infrastructure investments, we would force that private equity back into the core. We have to do that for our survival as a species. Once we have that in place, then we can talk about how we can create at a smaller spatial scale equitable cities now that we have that push of the capital back into the core. Great. Thank you very much, George. Susan. 